Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Low Code Revolution show. This is a brand new show that we have where we bring in industry experts to talk about how they revolutionize their apps and business processes with the Power Platform. This week, we're going to be joined by Christine Kaldinsky. She's going to be talking about how we can build accessible power apps. Stay tuned. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Low Code Revolution. This is a new show where we talk to industry experts about how they've transformed their business applications and processes with the Power Platform. My name is April Dunham, and I'm a Power Platform advocate here at Microsoft, and I'm your host today. Today, I'm joined by Christine Kolodinsky. Hi, Christine. How are you doing? Hi, April. I'm really well, thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Really happy to have you on the show today. I knew when we were chatting on LinkedIn, talking about some of the things you're working on with accessible apps, that we had to have you here on the show to share what you've been doing. So really happy to have you here. Um, so why don't you give everyone that's watching a little bit of background about yourself and how you got started building accessible power apps? Yes, sure. Thank you, April. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be on the show. Um, so my name is Christine Kolodziejski, as you rightly said. Thank you for pronouncing my surname really well as well. <laughs> um, I am a Microsoft Power Platform consultant based in London in the UK, and I work with all things Power Platform, Microsoft 365 and Azure. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you all about things accessibility wise. Awesome. Yeah. So I'm um, really curious to hear about, you know, you, you talked about how you're building accessible power apps. And it's a topic near and dear to my heart. And also Donna Sarkar, you know, used to be on the Power Platform team, now leading accessibility, um, really something we're passionate about here. So why don't you talk about, you know, what led you down the path of really wanting to get started um, building accessible power apps? Yeah, absolutely. So my journey with accessibility started quite recently, I'd say around two years ago. And I was working with a colleague and I was developing this dashboard for a colleague. And I remember making it really nice and visual um, with lots of charts, a lot of colors. And the next day I was really excited to show it to her um, so, so she can see the progress that I've made on the dashboard. And I presented it to her and I asked her, you know, what did you think about my visuals? And she said, Christine, I think the dashboard is amazing, but I couldn't actually tell the difference between the colors. Um, I haven't disclosed that to you, but I'm actually colorblind. And at that point, I was, you know, I was hit with this embarrassment and kind of anger because I had developed this beautiful dashboard and not even once throughout the development did I think about accessibility. And ever since I have been very focused on accessibility and making things accessible and inclusive to make sure that um, the applications and everything else that I do in life includes everyone. That, that's a great story. I think we all kind of have those aha moments. I know I have, if, if you're not, faced with some kind of accessibility um, you know, issue like that, you don't really think about it day to day um, and you never know because, you know, people that you work with, what they might be facing, you know, like colorblindness or whatever it might be. So definitely, you know, an eye-opening moment that I think we've all been through at one point in time to, uh, to keep in mind. Um, so curious though, you know, when you went down the path, you realized that one of your colleagues, you know, had colorblindness. So what are the other types of accessibility needs that we might have um, and what can we do? What are the steps that we can take to go down making our apps accessible? Yes, absolutely. So accessibility is such a huge topic and I think we all hear about it everywhere on the news right now. So in terms of accessibility, um, there are three main types of accessibility needs that you can have um, and that is permanent accessibility needs. Then you have temporary accessibility needs and also situational accessibility needs. So primarily, when we think of accessibility, the first kind of accessibility needs that we think of is uh, someone with mobility issues or someone with a visual impairment. But that is just a really small chunk of accessibility um, out there. Now, in terms of permanent accessibility needs that a person can have, um, there are various types. So like we said, that could be someone visually impaired, someone with a hearing impairment, someone with mobility impairment, but also someone with cognitive impairments, which I think gets skipped and overlooked quite frequently. And these are the kind of main uh, permanent disability um, accessibility um, needs that you can have. And that could be someone that's um, 
visually disabled, someone that wears a hearing aid, um, someone that is in a wheelchair, so is wheelchair bound, or someone that suffers from um, dyslexia, as an example, where they find it really difficult to read text and they find it um, really difficult to process the information in a uh, written format. The next category is temporary. Now, temporary happens to quite a lot of us because temporary is when um, something, an event that takes place in your life is causing you to have a temporary accessibility need. And that could be something as simple as breaking your arm, where as an example, your mobility is reduced. That could be an eye infection as an example, when um, you are not able to see or you're partially sighted. Or that could be an ear infection as an example, where um, you can't hear properly. And then you have what's called a situational accessibility need. Now, I'm going to blow your mind right now. Around 90% of us throughout our lifetimes have at least once had a situational accessibility need. And what is an accessibility need that's situational? That could be anything as simple as being in a loud environment. So whether that's a shopping mall, a nightclub, or even an office where people are talking and you can't really hear what you're saying to your colleague, that is a situation accessibility need because you are in a situation performing an activity that's causing you to have that requirement to ask someone, can you please speak louder or for you to rely on them um, talking clearly enough and you lip reading on them. That could be anything as driving a car and using an application on your mobile that will be giving you the directions while you're focusing on driving a car. And one of my favorite examples that I use quite often is, um, imagine yourself waking up in the night, thinking that you're really thirsty and wanting to go to the kitchen. And just while you're walking in the darkness, you stub your toe um, and it, it causes you a lot of pain. And that is a situation accessibility need where your vision was impaired because of the darkness around you. Now, why should we focus on accessibility? Because there are around 15% of people in the world right now with permanent accessibility needs. Now, when we include temporary and situational accessibility needs, that number is over 80% at any given time. Wow. So in terms of numbers, that is a huge number, isn't it, April? Now, yep. when you think around kind of what that looks like in terms of our population, that means that there's over 1 billion of people that are permanently um, disabled in one way or another um, that have that accessibility need and that disability that's causing them uh, to, to uh, require additional uh, features or additional um, improvements to, to ensure that they can lead the life they want. And that is a mind-blowing number when you think about it, isn't it? Uh, that's quite a lot. I and mean, this is a bit eye opening for me. I, I didn't even think about, you know, I think we tend to think about the permanent disability situations, but the temporary and the situational. I mean, when you were just describing that, I was thinking, man, I've been affected by by both of those myself, you know, with a temporary when I had an ear infection, I couldn't hear really well and in situational being in noisy environments. And you think about some of the things, too, that have been developed because of these accessibility issues like closed captioning um, that benefit people that you know, might not even be experiencing that. Like I use closed captioning all the time, just when I'm in a loud environment, right? Like trying I to watch do. something yeah. <laughs> and, and um, see what's there. So it's, it's really cool to think about all the different types of accessibility types that there are and how some of the technologies can benefit everyone, no matter, you know, whether you have permanent, temporary or situational uh, disability. Absolutely. No, I'm glad to agree. I'm glad to agree. Now, when we talk about accessibility, naturally, um, the first thing that we're going to get asked is, but why should I care? If these examples are not good enough, what I've just described to you is not good enough, why should I care? And I've listed four kind of key reasons why you should care. Now, as a developer, as an application maker, the first reason why you should care is that you will increase your end user adoption. So, by building accessible apps from the very start, so by uh, creating that um, accessibility app by design, you are increasing the user base that the app will be utilized by, by around 15%. Now, in a user group of 1,000 people, as an example, that is an extra 150 people at least that you will be adding to your user group that will be driving your end user adoption. And that is a huge number. Um, now, that is just one of the reasons. The second reason is naturally to create a very inclusive working environment. I think 
you know, the times we're in right now, um, a disability or even a personal characteristic should not exclude you in any environment at all. And I think by creating an inclusive working environment or creating an um, inclusive user group, you are creating a very positive and very optimistic um, environment. And in, in your workplace, as an example, that means that your workforce will then translate that positivity onto their customers, clients and other colleagues in the team as well. The third reason is saving time on future development as well. Now, the reason why is if you start developing a, an application without that accessibility in mind, what will inevitably end up happening is at some point accessibility will be raised as a point and as a developer or as an application maker, you're then having to try and reverse engineer and try and move your controls around, try and change the color schemes and you end up spending the same amount of time of redoing and redesigning your application in order to facilitate this. Whereas if you did all of this from the start and you, you thought of accessibility from the very first kind of step that you took, you would save that time, not just for now, but also for future developments if there are any needs for future enhancements. And the last reason, and it might sound very cliche, but I think given the last kind of 24 months that we have had with the pandemic in the world, um, I think one thing that we have all realized is that it is kind to be kind. So by being kind to people and, and you know, by showing them that you care, uh, you really are making the, the world a better place, as cliche as that might sound. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's cliche at all. I think that's my, my favorite reason. And I think it is important too to, to mention you know, the saving time. I mean, a lot of maybe hesitance to building accessibility into your apps might be, oh, it's going to be really time consuming to do. But first, you got to think of the kindness factor, right? And then making your apps accommodating at all. But second, it will save you time in the long run. So uh, really great that you called that out. Absolutely. No, yeah. I agree. So this has been, yeah, this has been amazing, um, good information. But what I'm really excited to see is I know you have a demo prepared for us about how we can add in some accessibility features on the Power Apps. So you want to show us what you built? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, um, April. I'm very excited to show the demo. So for the purposes of today's um, session, I have built an application, a very simple Power App. I have called it Find a Beach. I think, like I said, given what has been going on in the world for the last 24 months, I think we could all do with a bit of a vacation. So I thought, why not create an application where you can find a beach yourself? So what I will do is I will quickly dive into the application to show you some of the things that I have done to make my application more accessible. And I will actually show you in the demo how you and anyone else watching this um, video back can make the application more accessible. So I will just quickly log into my app right now. And if I go to log in, I am now taken to the main page of my screen. I will not save the password for this. And as you can see, we have this very simple application here that I'm um, able to use, find, an, uh, find a beach um, as an example, so find a holiday that I'm looking for. But that's not the, the thing that I want to focus on. The thing that I want to focus on is if you look to the bottom of my screen, you will see four controls and another button there. Now, naturally we have the user profile, which is the standard um, one, and then we have one that's related to the application. But what you can see right there and then is we have two buttons that have the accessibility right at the center of the application. And that is the screen reader and the change theme button. Now, what the screen reader will do is it will launch um, the, uh, the sound where the Microsoft Translator's connector will um, read the text and all of the accessible text on my screen. Now, to put yourself in a scenario where, um, as an example, as a person with accessibility needs you using a screen reader, um, they would normally log into the application from the mobile phone or they would log into the application from the um, Windows device, as an example, and they would use the the screen reader that they've downloaded or the built-in screen reader. So what I thought was, why not just take that a, a step further and actually build that screen reader right into the application? So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to click on play and you'll be able to listen exactly to what the screen reader is saying to us. Welcome, Christine Kolodziski. This is a gallery with all available beach holidays currently on offer. There are six of them in total. 
Please click on the holiday you're interested in to find out more information. There is also a navigation menu component to the bottom of the screen with five buttons. Starting from the left, navigate to your profile, read the screen, your basket, change mode to light or dark and the find your holiday screen. Welcome, Christine. Now, how cool is that? Isn't it so good to have that built in your application from the very start? So as, as the screen reader has just asked me to do, what I will do is I will proceed to one of these and I am now taken to the Find a Beach screen. Now, the way I have developed it is you can launch that screen reader in any screen of your application. So if I was to click you on here. You are previewing the trip to Horseshoe Bay. This trip will cost £799. That will now start reading what I have on my screen. So not only will it read the accessible labels that I have on my screen, but I have actually added additional text to um, the actual translator as well. So what I'm going to do is rather than actually show you um, what it does, I will show you how you as a developer, as an app maker can do that in your application yourself. So to the left hand side, we have our screen and I will navigate to my demo screen text to speech. Okay, so what you will need to do first is you will need to connect to the Microsoft Translator connector. That is the connector that you can leverage out of the box. So there is no development that you as a developer and app maker have has to do. So if I navigate to my environment here, as you can see, I have that um, connection made already there. It's the Microsoft Translator um, there. Now, when you click to connect, you will be asked for a subscription key. For personal development purposes, you can leave that blank and you will still be able to connect and it will use what's called a shared um, connection key. However, as with our shared things and shared connections, there is a throttling limit and a character limit that you will uh, quickly meet um, if building an application like this. So what you will need to do is you will need to get a free subscription key from the Microsoft Translators website and it is available right there. And Microsoft, as they have done, and they always do, have documented really well how you can set that up. Now, what you will need to do is you will need to create a resource first in your Azure tenant. And if I navigate to my Azure tenant, and in your Azure tenant, you will need to um, obviously create the resource, and then you will be provided with the endpoint uh, keys. And if I just click on there, I am now given the subscription keys that I can use and I can just copy them and paste them into the um, field there. Now, one thing to note, in order to set that up, you do have to be a global admin or an application admin. So if you don't have those permissions, you will need to speak to your friendly neighborhood admin uh, who will be able to do that for you instead. If you do, awesome, you will be able to do that. Now, this subscription key, again, like I said, is free. And with that key, you will be able to use up to 2 million characters in your Microsoft Translator connector, which is amazing. And that's a really wow. huge number. So what I will do is I will now click on save and that will now update my connector. And what I will do is if I navigate back to my um, application, the first thing that you will need to do is you will need to insert an audio control. So as you can see, I have my audio control in there. And in the media property of your audio control, you will need to use the connector there. So we have the Microsoft Text-to-Speech, um, if I just Microsoft Translator Connector. Again. Oops, Text-to-Speech, there we go. So the first thing that we will need to do is we'll need to provide the query to what we want to transcribe to speech. So I will query uh, label one, and then dot text. And once that's done, we just need to specify the English, uh, the language tag. So if you're not sure what language tag you need to use, I have made it very easy for you. And as you can see, I have placed a resource there with all of the available language codes. So if you go to that website, you will be able to see all of the localized language codes as well. So you as a developer don't have an excuse to not do that yourself too. And once I have done that, if I click on play, HTTPS colon double forward slash www dot. As you can see, I will not leave that till the end. As you can see, that's automatically reading the text. And this is as simple as it is to create that Microsoft Translator connector and actually build a screen reader into your application yourself. Now, if you 
don't want to do this as an example, or you have an application that will need to work offline and you're worried that uh, calling the um, connector, you know, uh, will not be possible, you can actually as a developer record this yourself as you can as a developer ask a friendly colleague again with a nice voice to record a quick short description of your screen and insert that as a media file to your application and have that running in there. Alternatively, um, again, you know, that's not always possible. What you might want to use if you want to make sure that your application is available and readable by a screen reader, you can actually use the built-in Windows narrator. And not everyone knows that ever since Windows um, XP, um, every single Windows release comes with the built-in narrator. And what I mean is if I just go to my Windows tab and I type in narrator, as you can see, I am now able to launch the Narrate application. And what this will effectively do is this will launch the screen reader right there and then. There's no configuration that you need to do. The moment you launch this app, it will launch the screen reader. Now, I won't launch it just because it will obviously start reading my uh, screen straight away. But that's one way to make your um, screen a lot more accessible. So the next thing that I want to show you is how as an app maker, you can change your colors dynamically. So if I just go to my screen below, if we just go to the additional screen um, here, as you can see, we have this button there. If I just click on play, we have this button there that will allow you to change the theme in your application dynamically. Now, when I click on that, what is effectively happening is it's switching into the dark mode. Now, I'm not sure about you, April, but me, um, the first thing I tend to do in every single application and including Microsoft Teams is switch my application to the dark mode. And the reason why is I find that it's a lot easier on my eyes. What do you think, April? Yeah, I, I do the same thing. VS Code, Teams, all of my office apps, I'm <laughs> dark mode all the way. It definitely makes me be able to look at the screen longer, right? It makes my eyes not get as tired. Definitely. And I think when we sit in front of the screen, it's very easy to get tired eyes from looking at a really bright screen as well, isn't it? So how cool would it be to have this and be able to change your colors dynamically and let your users actually do it throughout the application suite um, themselves? So what I have done here is if I also just navigate to one of the other screens, you will see that this has automatically applied that label across all of the screens in my application. Now, the way I have done it is I have done it a really easy way so that you, like I said, as a developer and app maker, will be able to do that very quickly yourself. So in order to do this, what we will be doing is we will need to call a global variable. And if I just navigate to my screen with the color changes, if we just go there, if I just switch my theme to light mode again, what we will do in here is when I toggle this, as you can see, that's changing the scheme of the background and it's also changing the color of the text. And to make that slightly easier to identify, I have put the variable here so you can see how that's changing. Now, it is as easy as going to your app on start property. And if we go to the app on start property, in the app on start property, I am calling a global variable and I have called it via dark mode. So by default, when you launch the application, as you can see, I have made that as false. So that will launch the application in light mode. And when I toggle the toggle to the right, that will turn that variable um, to true and that will effectively um, make it uh, true. So all that you need to do as an app maker is you need to assign your controls, so everything that you're using in your screen, to that variable. So if I was to just go to my background as an example, what you will see is happening there is I am calling that variable there in the fill property of my background, and I am setting the background fill based on the variable um, and the Boolean value. So if the variable of dark mode is set to false, I am changing the fill of my background to white. Otherwise, so when it's true, I am changing it to the var primary color. And my var primary color is the global variable, again, that I'm closing, closing uh, sorry, calling in my application. Um, that's an RGBA value here. And that's all you need to do. Now, in terms of your text, you need to do the, exactly the same. So if I was to just go to one of these and I'll go to the color property of my text, if I just go to my color property of my task text, as you can see, I'm doing exactly the same with the color property. So I'm changing my far deck mode um, 
to false and if the variable is set to false, the color of the text will be the var primary color. If it isn't, so any other case, my uh, color of the text will be white. And that is as simple as that. Isn't it easy, April? That, I love that. I, that's something that I've used in a lot of the apps that I built there, the, um, the variables to be able to globally set styles like that with the dark side. It's really cool. I uh, see that's a really common pattern. Cool to see you using it for the dark light mode for accessibility in your app. Brilliant. Thank you, April. Now, there is something else that you can do as well. So how cool would it be if you could also change the size of your text in your application? So if you are visually impaired or even if you um, are sitting far away from your screen, you might find it a lot easier to actually make your screen larger. So how cool would it be to just switch the toggle on and have your screen and all your pictures bigger as well. Now, in order to do this, hopefully you will have got the pattern by now. All I am doing is I am calling a global variable again, and I am baselining my, the size of the text on this variable. So if I just go back to my text property, and we'll go to the size property of my text control. There we go. All I am doing here is I am setting the size of the text based on my variable again. So my for font size, by default, it will be false, which to me will be that the text is of regular size. Um, I know it's not a very clear variable and apologies to everyone watching that back. So all I'm doing here is if the text is false, uh, sorry, if the variable is set to false, the text will be um, of size 24. If it is set to true, my text will be 30, which will make the text bigger. The same applies to my image control. So this is just an SVG that I'm using in the application. And if I was to just go to my height property as an example, um, there we go. If I just go to my height property, all I am doing here is again, I am setting the size of uh, the height based on the variable itself. And that's as easy as it is. Now, it's all cool being able to do that throughout the application, but April, how cool would that be if as an end user, you closed the application, you launched it again, and all of your preferences were saved? Wouldn't that be amazing? That, that would be awesome. I'll have to reconfigure any of that, yeah. Definitely. So one thing that I like is um, being able to save preferences in all my applications. And what I'm actually going to show you is how you as a developer again, or as an app maker, can take user preferences and allow them to save them for the next time they launch their app. Now, all that we're doing in here is we, again, have the variables assigned to each one of these. So if I go to one of these, what you will see in the unchanged property of the toggles. We have the dark mode, and then if we toggle, we have uh, that will switch the value of the var dark mode variable to the opposite of what it is. So in order to save the preferences, what you will need to do is you will need to have some kind of database sitting at the back. So whether that's an Excel spreadsheet or a SharePoint list or a dataverse table, it doesn't matter as long as you have that set up in the background. So if I go to my database, this is where I'm keeping it. So all I'm doing is a very simple um, list in SharePoint. And we have a couple of columns. The first column is the name of the user. Then we have the font. Now we have two fonts, uh, font size types, and I'll show you that in a second. We have regular font and large font. Then we have the color theme, which is light and dark. And then we have the screen reader autoplay, which is false set to false by default. We can change that to true. So if I just go back to application, and I'll go to my button there. All that I'm doing in here is I am saving that preference and patching my list. So based on what the user is saying to me, um, I am patching the record that I am I found in the SharePoint list. And if the toggle is set to the left, I am saving that preference for the default theme is light. If it's set to the right, I am saving that preference to dark. So if I was to show you that in real life right now, if I just toggle that to the right and I'll go to save my preferences and I'll go to app on start. If I run my app again, that will change the mode automatically. Now, in order to do that, there's one more step that you need to do is obviously you will need to look up that value against the user. So if I go to my on start, app on start property again and I'll scroll to the very bottom of my um, formulas, you will see right there that we have this formula there and in the app on start property, I am looking up the user record 
And if their color theme preference is saved to light, we will set the variable, the global variable that we called early on in the application to false. If their preference is, is dark, or obviously in any other case, we will set that as true. Now, one thing to be mindful of is that the global variable that we have here is sitting within a concurrent formula. Now, the concurrent formula will run a lot of the formulas at the same time to save the time on loading. What you will need to do is you will need to ensure that this lookup control here, this value here, is sitting outside of the concurrent because by default, the application will run in light mode and this value right there is depending on that. Uh, formula. So you need to make sure that there is no arguments between the two of them. And you can do exactly the same for all of the other controls. So if I was to save my font size to large, and I'll click on save my preferences. If I just go back again, if I click run app on start, this should not, um, this should shortly set that to large, as you can see. And that's as easy as it is. You can do exactly the same with the screen reader as well. Wow, this has been amazing. So much, so much goodness to unpack here. We learned a ton with this. I one of the things that stood out to me is just how easy it is to implement this. I mean, it's all out of the box stuff. Um, we can in so many different ways to do it. With you know, as far as the the text to speech stuff, we can use translator. We can record our own audio. We can use narrator. So really, it seems like the possibilities are are endless in so many different ways that we can do this. Um, so it's so much to learn. So thank you for that amazing demo. Not a problem at all. Thank you, April. And like I said, the options are unlimited. So the amount of things that you can do as a developer are unlimited. There are various resources um, available out there that you can utilize to make your apps more accessible. And in addition to that, I will be posting this application on my GitHub. So I'll make this application available to everyone with everything that's currently in there. So if you're watching this as a developer, as a maker, and you find yourself wanting to develop an accessible application, you will be able to go to my GitHub repository and download it completely for free and use it and start building applications yourself. Amazing. So I guess people should uh, follow you on Twitter there to find the link there for the for the solution that you post. Or <laughs> Definitely. Yes, absolutely. And within my application as well, I have left a number of useful resources that you can utilize. So if you want to access any of the websites or any of the resources that I've showed today, uh, please go to the links in my screens and you'll be able to use them and start building more accessible apps for all. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing all this great information about accessibility and power apps, Christine. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, April, and hopefully see you again soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Stay tuned for the next episode of the Low Code Revolution.